Praise Yahweh. Welcome to the Assembly of Yah here at Marseilles, Illinois. Today is a very, very special day. It's a beautiful day outside. Uh, the sun is out. It's about 82 degrees or so. It's wonderful. But uh, even more than that, for those in the outreach program, we welcome you too. Today is the first day of unleavened bread. It is the 15th of Abib, or Nisan, if you'd like to use uh, that particular term. Uh, it's a Babylonian word, but it still applies. It's the 15th day of Yahweh's calendar month. It is the 30th of April, 2010. We thank you for being with us. We have a message today and a discussion uh, and some presentations, of course, from the scriptures that will deal with the days of unleavened bread, uh, the first day of unleavened bread, how we keep the Sabbath, uh, what are the commandments that apply and the words that apply today, we are commanded to come before Yahweh to have a set-apart meeting, a convocation, a reading of the law before him on this day. And this day is very, very important. It's important for two major, major reasons, but many, many other reasons, is that this day, it says in the Old Testament, that we actually came out of Egypt by night on the 15th. This is the day that we came out of Egypt. But... We are called today now to come out of Babylon, out of pagan government, out of pagan religion, pagan practices, carnalness, immorality, and be Kodesh as Yahweh is Kodesh. We're called to come out today in the spiritual way, in a lifestyle way that is honors Yahweh and Yahshua, and especially Yahshua is our elder brother, high priest, our lamb, we just took the Passover, as his example, to be a right example, the same character as he is following that road of conversion. So this is a very, very important day. It's more significant because what we do today is by the scripture, by spiritual things that we have been called, and those who are on the outreach and those who hear us are of Yahweh, we have been called to truth. If we hadn't been called to truth, if his hand had not been upon us, we would not even be here today speaking of the things that we're talking about and doing the things we're doing. So we praise Yahweh and we praise Yahshua. So at this time, as we normally do, we're going to turn the program over to Beverly for praise and worship. Hallelujah. 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 I'd like you to turn to your songbooks to number six, Thy Loving Kindness.
turn to number 12. Surely, goodness and mercy. Yeah. 
number 30. We will sing 30 and then jump right over on the other page to number 32. <coughs> I will sing of the mercies and river of life. I will sing of the mercies of Yahweh. Praise Yahweh, praise Yahshua. Thank you, Beverly, for leading that beautiful and inspiring music. We remember and we recall that the praises of Yahweh come up before him. And it brings the spirit of Yahweh when we praise and we get into worship before him and come before his throne. We know that that's true. <clears throat> so at this time, because we have just finished praising, not finished, but we have finished this section. We want to, while we have Yahweh's definite attention, bring up our prayer requests. And we're going to take time for those prayer requests. And again, as we always do at this time, we remind you that no matter how dark a situation seems or how complicated or difficult or overwhelming, the most powerful thing and the first thing we should do is go before Yahweh and Yeshua. Today, no matter when you receive this DVD on the outreach program, we ask you to pray for two people. We ask you to pray for Jeremy, a dear young man that has been healed of MS. He uh, regularly attends Hector Castillo's assembly, uh, Shalom Assembly of Yahweh, S-A-Y, up in Sterling, Illinois, but he was from Wisconsin. He is trying to get a job, uh, continue his healing, and get a car possibly that he can uh, have this job and, and start a life from coming out of being so disabled. His name is Jeremy. We also ask you to pray for Jimmy Webwana. Jimmy Webwana, he is our pastor, one of the pastor's affiliates and the sister assemblies that we have over in Kenya, Africa. And he has an assembly of about 50 people. We ask that you would please bless him, strengthen him as a leader and the elders there. Bless the assembly as they keep the days now of unleavened Passover and unleavened bread and uh, be blessed in Yahshua. So those are the prayer requests we make before you. We're going to take our regular time uh, today. So we'll be back with you momentarily. Hallelujah.
Hallelujah. Praise Yahweh. We have to speak. It says that uh, ministers should speak and the brethren should speak in season. And that means that season is 4150. That means within the holy days, when we're in holy days or a certain convocation time in Yahweh's corner, we should speak about what that time is about. And of course, this is the first day of unleavened bread. So I want to uh, go into a short study, uh, Torah review, which will also be an introduction to our main message today. Uh, we can turn to Exodus 12, 15. And we are commanded to keep these days. These are basic scriptures, but again, we need to review. Paul said that if I put you in memory, remembrance of these things, I have done well. Exodus 12, 15. And, of course, this is Torah, this is commandments, uh, law that Yeshua gave, Yahweh gave to Moshe. Seven days shall ye eat unleavened bread. And that word unleavened is matzah. It means without leavening or raising, matzah. Even the day before ye shall put away leaven out of your houses, for whosoever eateth leaven <coughs> bread, mat, uh, unleavened bread, or whosoever eateth leavened bread, which is the word uh, commits from the first day unto the seventh day, that soul shall be cut off from Israel. This is one of the seven things that we have to do as believers, as Yahweh people, is to keep the Passover and unleavened bread. It's a sign. The Sabbath, it says, is a sign unto them, a spiritual mark as true believers. Also, Passover and unleavened bread. You have to do it. You turn away from those things, plus a few others we won't talk about, you are out of the calling of first fruits. You're done. Mm -hmm. So this is very, very important. So we get rid of unleavened bread for seven days, and then each day we have to eat a small piece of unleavened bread every day. And that unleavened bread is different than what we took with Passover. With Passover, the unleavened bread we take represents Yeshua's body. He says, this body is broken for you. Now it can still be like matzah, Israel matzah bread, flat bread. But the meaning when we go into the days of unleavened bread is completely different. It's being a new life, a new person in Yahshua, not puffed up with pride, wickedness, malice, coming in spirit and truth, and on that road of conversion, changing and turning, repenting and turning away from sin and the things defile. And for this time, in this period of time in the spring, we call days of unleavened bread. Things that have leaven in them represent sin. So we go through our houses and we get all of our leaven out. Very basic stuff. I know that you understand that, but we're supposed to review that. It's a mandatory thing. <clears throat> so continue in Exodus 12, 16. And in the first day you shall have a Kodesh convocation. And in the seventh day, the last day, there shall be a Kodesh convocation to you. No manner of work shall be done in them in those two days, save that which every man must eat, and I think that our message is going to touch on some of that, must eat that only may be done of you. 17. And ye shall observe the Feast of Unleavened Bread, for in this selfsame day I brought your armies, or brought your people, that's Israel, out of the land of Egypt. Therefore shall ye observe this day in your generations, by ordinance forever. La olam va'ed, forever. It's not going to be done away with. In the first month, on the 14th day of the month at even, or sundown, ye shall eat unleavened bread. Now, this sundown is on the 14th. That means the end of the 14th. All right? It's the end of the 14th. You shall eat unleavened bread until the 1 and 20th day of the month at even. When you calculate that out and think about it, it's seven days. Seven days shall there be no leaven found in your houses. You can't put it in your garage. You can't put it in your freezer. You can't put it in your storage area. It's got to be gone off your property. For whatsoever or whosoever eateth that which is leavened, even that soul shall be cut off from the congregation of Israel, the body of Messiah, whether he be a stranger or born in the land. That still applies today. Now, 
for new people that are coming in that may be on the outreach program, that makes this may sound silly to you. But it's not silly, it's not frivolous, it's not small before Yahweh. These are serious, serious commands. And they have to do with the plan of salvation, they have to do with repentance, it has to do with conversion, it has to do with his calling. It has to do with his son, because his son was unleavened. His son was perfect, without spot or blemish, without wrinkle. The Lamb and Yahshua that came as the Lamb of Yahweh. John told us, Behold the Lamb of Yahweh. <clears throat> These are not small things. And we know some brethren, it says they are sick and weak among us. Paul said, that don't understand these things and keep it the way Yahweh says. This is very serious. Verse 20. Ye shall eat nothing. Ye shall eat nothing leavened. In all your habitations ye shall eat unleavened bread. So you have to have unleavened bread every day and everything that's leavened. Not just bread, sometimes soups, candy bars. Mm -hmm. Uh, muffins, snacks, pretzels, uh, many things that we have have leavening in it that raises up like that. So we do a thorough, serious search starting weeks before unleavened bread, mm -hmm. looking for everything in the house. Mm -hmm. And the week before or two weeks before, we have a box to mm -hmm. give some instruction here. We take everything that is left that is leavened and put in a box on the counter in the kitchen so we know this has to be eaten or thrown out before mm -hmm. the days come. Mm -hmm. We vacuum the floors, we vacuum out the toaster that has crumbs in it, we, we do a diligent search and of course Yahweh uses this not only in the real but the surreal, the metaphoric, that we should look within our hearts, examine ourselves for any sin, iniquity, trespass, attitude very serious. If we don't examine ourselves, and I'll read in a minute, He will judge us if we don't judge and repent ourselves. He will come upon us, and He will correct us. He will rebuke, it, rebuke us. Or even, we may even leave the calling, be out of the calling, because we never really repented of the things in our hearts. These are the feasts of Yahweh. That's what he says. Let's go to Leviticus. Leviticus starts out, These are the feasts of Yahweh in Leviticus 23. Leviticus chapter 23. I'm going to go to read uh, verses 6 through 8. It's a parallel teaching. It's parallel information. It's another witness. And it gives us a little more information. On the 15th day of the same month, which is the day that we have right here of Yahweh's calendar, the fifteenth day of the same month is the Feast of Unleavened Bread. Unto Yahweh. It is not man's feast, it's his feast. It's not Israel's feast, it's Yahweh's feast. Seven days ye must eat unleavened bread. In the first day ye shall have a Kodesh convocation, ye shall do no servile work, but ye shall offer an offering made by fire. Our offerings are our prayers. Our offerings are our praise and our worship. We don't do animal sacrifice anymore. So we are to come before Yahweh with our offerings. Made by fire, that means pure unto Yahweh seven days. In the seventh day is a Kodesh convocation. You shall do no servile work therein. So he says that we should come before him. All right? In Deuteronomy 16, 16, we always read this. Three times a year. This is a commandment. This is a, one of the things that is required of Israelites, those who are in the body of Messiah. Deuteronomy 16, 16. Three times in a year shall all your males, and that doesn't mean just males, that's the minimum. What it means really is the, the head of the family and his family, if they can come. And the, and the intent is that the entire family come. All right. He's talking about the leadership, and of course the males are going to bring their family. He's not going to tell his wife to stay home or the children because they need instruction. They need the feast to keep the feast. They need that fellowship. They need the things that Yahweh is going to provide at that meeting. So it is not the right intention here to say it's only the males. That is not the intention he's saying. Three times a year shall all the males appear before Yahweh, thy Elohim, in the place which he shall choose. He shall choose. You've got to pray about this where you're supposed to go. 
in the Feast of Unleavened Bread, in the Feast of Weeks, okay, which is called sometimes Pentecost in the Greek, or Shavuot, right? And in the Feast of Tabernacles, it's called Sukkot also. And they shall not appear before Yahweh empty. That means that we should bring our tithes, offerings, free will offerings, and things that we want to give. It can be agricultural, it can be animals, it can be money. And because I read this, it has nothing to do with me. It has nothing to do with this assembly or receiving money from people. It's reminding us that all the brethren should be bringing their offerings before Yahweh. It's the righteous thing that he wants us to do. It doesn't merit matter who you give it to as far as you give it to ministry. I think it goes to ministry because it's about Yahweh's work. But it's not about any particular ministry. It doesn't have to go to a particular place. But we can't come empty before Yahweh. <clears throat> Just one of our last points here. Some people say that the Old Testament is done away with. We don't have to do this. But Yahshua and the disciples kept the feast of the Passover and unleavened bread and the other feasts. You can find some of that information in Matthew 26, 17. Matthew 26, 17. <clears throat> we are to keep the feast by putting sin out of our lives, as we said earlier. So we have a couple of admonitions here in the New Testament. Paul talking to uh, the Corinthians in 1 Corinthians 5, 6. 1 Corinthians 5, 6. And they have some the problems in the uh, Corinthian assembly, and he's writing them about. And they have some pride, they have some <coughs> sin, they have some things going on in the assembly. <coughs> Now remember that in your studies that it says in other places that pride puffs up the person, kind of like leavened bread puffs up, it raises up. So he makes this metaphor here. He says in verse 6, he says, Your boasting is not good. Know ye not that a little leaven leaveneth the whole lump, it spreads through the whole lump, it spreads through the whole, it contaminates everything. Purge out, therefore, the old leaven, that ye may be a new lump, as ye are unleavened. In other words, we're supposed to be unleavened. We said we want to be unleavened. We're commanded to be unleavened, get sin out of our lives. He said, you are unleavened. So get rid of the leaven. For even the Messiah, our Passover, because they're keeping the days of unleavened bread, Messiah, our Passover, is sanctified <coughs> for us. Therefore, let us keep the feast. He's talking about unleavened bread feast. Let us keep the feast, not with the old leaven or old sin, neither with the leaven of malice or wickedness. Bad attitudes. We dress all up, we come with a happy face, we come with our scriptures in our hands, but maybe in our hearts there's some bad attitudes. He says, don't come with the leaven of malice and wickedness, but with the unleavened bread, unleavened bread of sincerity and truth. And, of course, we have to worship in truth, in spirit and truth. Paul makes the point that before we come to the Passover, before we do this feast, that we should examine ourselves. But I say unto you that we should always be examining ourselves. 1 Corinthians 11, 26 through 31. 1 Corinthians 11, 26 through 31. For as often as ye eat this bread and drink this cup, ye do show the master's death until he come. He said, Do this in remembrance of me. Wherefore, whosoever shall eat this bread and drink this cup of the master unworthily shall be guilty, guilty of the body and the blood of the master, just like they were in Jerusalem, shouting out, Impale him away from him. Very serious accusation. Verse 28, but let the man examine himself. That man, what man? Believers that are coming to the table and keeping the feast. Let that man and woman and person examine themselves. So let them eat of that bread and drink of that cup. For he that drinketh, eateth, and drinketh unworthily, eateth and drinketh condemnation, or in some uh, testaments and writings, damnation to himself, not discerning the master's body. Serious, very serious. We should come before the table and keep these feasts with fear and reverence. 
still rejoicing before Yahweh. For this cause, because of these things, because of malice, because of wickedness, because of sin, because of not discerning the master's body, because of not a right heart and things that are going on, this leaven he's talking about, for this cause, Paul says in verse 30, many, not some, many are wicked, are weak and sickly among us in the congregation. Weak and sickly among you, and many sleep. For if we would, and here's the point, if we would judge ourselves, examine ourselves, apply the scripture, get in the spirit, ask Yahweh to reveal secret sins as David prayed, if we would judge ourselves, we would not be judged. And of course he means to repent and turn also. If we judge ourselves and listen to the spirit and repent, <clears throat> Yahweh doesn't have to punish us, rebuke us, or even chastise us. That doesn't have to happen. And at his coming, we will rejoice. Because at his coming, he says, my reward is in my hand for you. If we judge ourselves, keep our skirts clean, stay unleavened, he comes with a reward for us. That's what we look forward to. Just a short uh, Torah study of the basic scriptures for today. I want to introduce now our main speaker for our main message today, our new uh, friend and uh, old brother, been in a long time in the faith, Marcel Debral, uh, and his wife is here. They came all the way from uh, Brussels, Belgium, to keep the feast with us. And Marcel has a good message for us today. Uh, please receive him. Uh, brethren, let's say greetings from Belgium. If you know, don't know where that is, that is somewhere in uh, Western Europe, just across the channel from uh, from Britain, from England. So I am far away from home, but I'm happy to be here uh, amongst uh, true believers, also keeping the feast days at the right dates. My uh, subject for today is keep the Sabbath, or more exactly, how to keep the Sabbath. Um, maybe I will be saying a number of things that, uh, that you are all aware of, hopefully even. But for those on the outreach, there may be some new elements. And it's necessary that we review uh, things, even those things that we know. And that we can also refute those who contradict us and uh, those who contradict us may even be Sabbath keepers themselves who have a more liberal view on certain things. The Sabbath is probably the most visible difference between Yahweh's true assembly and mainstream Christian churches. I did say visible because of course in in uh, assemblies of Yahweh, the sacred names groups, the first thing you will hear is the names Yahweh, Yahshua. But when you look at behavior, Sabbath keeping uh, makes us different. It's usually the first thing outsiders notice about us as a group that we worship on Saturdays instead of on Sundays. It's a sign that we are different, and that's exactly. Yahweh's intention. Let us turn to Exodus 31. <coughs> it's a very well known scripture. Exodus 31, verses 12 to 17. And Yahweh spake unto Moses, saying, Speak thou also unto the children of Israel, saying, Verily my Sabbaths you shall keep. For it is a sign between me and you throughout your generations, that you may know that I am Yahweh that does sanctify you. You shall, you shall keep the Sabbath, therefore, for it is holy unto you. Everyone that defiles it shall surely be put to death. For whosoever does any work therein, 
that Saul shall be cut off from among his people. Six days, work, work, six days may work be done, but in the seventh is the Sabbath of rest holy to Yahweh. Whosoever does any work in the Sabbath day, he shall surely be put to death. Wherefore the children of Israel shall keep the Sabbath to observe the Sabbath throughout their generations for a perpetual covenant. It is a sign between me and the children of Israel forever, for in six days Yahweh made heaven and earth, and on the seventh day he rested and was refreshed. So notice twice we read here in verses 13 and 17 that observing the Sabbaths is a sign between Yahweh and the Israelites. And we know that Yahweh doesn't have one set of rules for uh, Israel and another set of rules for Gentiles. As the Apostle Paul explained in Romans 11:17, he won't turn there, the Gentiles are grafted in Israel that he compares with a cultivated olive tree. So all true believers are grafted in as spiritual Jews or Israelites and must give the law, including the Sabbath. Let's go back to Exodus 13 and read verses 13 and 16 again. Verse 13, Speak thou also unto the children of Israel, saying, Verily my Sabbaths you shall keep, for it is a sign between me and you throughout your generations, that you may know that I am Yahweh that does sanctify you. And then verse 16, Wherefore the children of Israel shall keep the Sabbath, to observe the Sabbath throughout their generations for a perpetual covenant. Maybe you noticed in verse 13, the word Sabbaths is plural, and in verse 16 it is singular. So, observing all of Yahweh's Sabbaths, both the weekly and the annual Sabbaths, is a sign between Yahweh and those who belong to Him. And this today, the first day of Unleavened Bread, is one of those annual Sabbaths that we are commanded to keep. Today I want to examine with you how we are to observe the Sabbaths, both annual and weekly. Considering the death penalty that Yahweh promises for those who profane it, we certainly wouldn't want to profane it, would we? So let's turn to the very first place in the Bible that mentions the word Sabbath, and that's in Exodus 16. Exodus 16, verses 4 and 5. Uh, in the first few verses of this chapter we read that the entire in Israelite community grumbled against Moses and Aaron because they were afraid to die of hunger in the wilderness. And then we come to verse 4. Then said Yahweh unto Moses, Behold, I will rain bread from heaven for you, and the people shall go out and gather a certain rate every day, that I may prove them whether they will walk in my law or no. And it shall come to pass that on the sixth day they shall prepare that which they bring in, and it shall be twice as much as they gather daily. So here we see that Yahweh tested them to see whether or not they would follow his instructions. Let's go down to verses 21 to 23, same chapter, Exodus 16, verse 21. And they gathered it every morning, that is the, the manna, Every man according to his eating, and when the sun grew hot, it melted. And it came to pass that on the sixth day they gathered twice as much bread, two omers for one man, and all the rulers of the congregation came and told Moses. And he said unto them, This is that which Yahweh has said, Tomorrow is the rest of the holy Sabbath unto Yahweh. Bake that which you will bake today, and boil that you will boil, and that which remains over lay up for you to be kept until the morning. 
So right here in this place, when the Sabbath commandment is introduced for the very first time in the Bible, Yahweh tells his people to bake or boil a double amount on the sixth day and eat what is left over on the Sabbath. So the Sabbath is not the right day to prepare meals, but rather a day to eat what you have prepared in advance. The, the context of Exodus 16 is of course the weekly Sabbath. There is a def difference with uh, most annual Sabbaths because we can prepare our food on the annual Sabbaths as we read in Exodus 12, 15 to 16. Elder Micah Badoska already read these verses but let's review them again. Exodus 12, verses 15 and 16. Seven days shall you eat unleavened bread, even the first day you shall put away leaven out of your houses. For whosoever eats unleavened bread from the first day until the seventh day, that soul shall be cut off from Israel. And in the first day there shall be an holy convocation, and in the seventh day there shall be an holy convocation to you. No manner of work shall be done in them, save that which every man must eat, that only may be done of you. So these verses speak only of the first and the seventh day of the Feast of Unleavened Bread. But by carefully reading Leviticus 23, we see that we are not to do any work uh, on the weekly Sabbath. I want to draw first your attention again to the last part of verse 16, Exodus 12, 16. No manner of work shall be done in them, save that which every man must eat, that only may be done of you. So that is referring to food preparation, which may be done on the first day and the last day of unleavened bread. And Leviticus 23, verse 3. Six days shall work be done, but the seventh day is a Sabbath of rest and holy convocation. You shall do no work therein. It is the Sabbath of Yahweh in all your dwellings. So Yahweh's instruction for the weekly Sabbath is don't do any work at all on the weekly Sabbath. Yahweh's instruction for the annual Sabbaths is slightly different. Let's turn to verses 7 and 8. This is again about the feast that we are in now, the Feast of Unleavened Bread. In the first day you shall have an holy convocation, you shall do no servile work therein. But you shall offer an offering made by fire unto Yahweh seven days. In the seventh day is an holy convocation, you shall do no servile work therein. If you read different uh, translations of these uh, verses, for instance, the New King James Version, it says, you shall do no customary work on it. In the Holman Christian Standard Bible, this is translated as, you are not to do any daily work on the first and the seventh day of the Feast of Unleavened Bread. The King James Version has, you shall do no servile work therein, same as what we read here. And today's new international version has do no regular work. Now, if you if we read through the chapter 23, Leviticus 23, then we will find the same clauses several times. We find the same instruction to do no customary work on Pest Pentecost in verse 21. Let's read it. Leviticus 23, 21, and you shall proclaim on the self same day, this is uh, Pentecost, that it may be a holy convocation unto you, you shall do no servile work therein. It shall be a statute forever in all your dwellings throughout your generations. So again, the same clause, the same phrase, no servile work. Then we go to the Feast of Trumpets in verse 25. You shall do no servile work therein. 
that you shall offer an offering made by fire unto Yahweh. Again, no servile work on the Feast of Trumpets. Let's go to the Feast of Tabernacles, verse 35, speaking of the first day of the Feast of Tabernacles. On the first day shall be an holy convocation, you shall do no servile work therein. Then the next verse, talking about the eighth day. Seven days you shall offer an offering made by fire unto Yahweh. On the eighth day shall be an holy convocation unto you. And you shall offer an offering made by fire unto Yahweh. It is, an so it is a solemn assembly, and you shall do no servile work therein. Again, no servile work. And then we skipped the Day of Atonement. Uh, we did that purposely. On the other hand, we are told to do no work on the Day of Atonement in verse 28. Leviticus 23, 28. And you shall do no work in that same day, for it is a day of atonement to make an atonement for you before Yahweh your Elohim. So, to summarize, the same restriction applies on the weekly Sabbath and the Day of Atonement. We are not to do any work at all on those days. On the six other annual holy days we are not to do any customary work. So, the question is, what is the difference between no customary work and no work at all? Well, we have already seen in Exodus 12.16 that no work may be done on the first and the seventh day of the Feast of Unleavened Bread, except for preparing what people need to eat. Let's read it again. Exodus 12.16 And in the first day there shall be an holy convocation, and in the seventh day there shall be an holy convocation to you, no manner of work shall be done in them, save that which every man must eat. That only may be done of you. <clears throat> so putting together this verse with Leviticus 23, we must conclude that on the weekly Sabbath and on the Day of Atonement we are not to do any work, not even preparing any food, and that on the other six annual holy days we are to do no work, except for preparing what we need to eat. So that's the difference between the two. Now let's turn to the second passage in the Bible that gives us instructions regarding the Sabbath. And this is in Exodus 20, where Yahweh gives the Ten Commandments. Let's understand this fourth commandment, uh, Sabbath commandment, this uh, fourth commandment correctly. Here, uh, Exodus 20, verses 8 to 11. Remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy. Six days shalt thou labor and do all thy work. But the seventh day is the Sabbath of Yahweh thy Elohim. In it thou shalt not do any work, thou nor thy son nor thy daughter, thy manservant nor thy maidservant, nor thy cattle, nor thy stranger with it, that is within thy gates. For in six days Yahweh made heaven and earth, the sea and all that in them is, and rested the seventh day. Wherefore Yahweh blessed the seventh day and hallowed it. So, going back to verse uh, 9, Six days shalt thou labor and do all thy work. To me this sounds like an order that we must work Sunday through Friday. So are we sinning if we take vacation and don't do any work on Tuesday for instance? Mm. Or if we decide to devote an entire Sunday to fasting, prayer and Bible study without doing any work all day long? Is that a sin? The way uh, Exodus 20 verse 9 is translated here, it sure sounds like it. But that's really not what Yahweh intended here. So let's read this verse in a few other translations. Exodus 29 in God's Word translation. 
you have six days to do all your work and uh, this is also in line with the Holman Christian Standard Bible translation of Exodus 31 15 that we have already read together for six days work may be done so Yahweh is giving us six days to do all our work we must organize our work so as to finish it in six days if we can do it in five days well that's just fine with Yahweh if we go on vacation for a week and we don't do any work all week long that's okay too and if we devote one or more days to fasting prayer and Bible study and meditation without working at all that's certainly pleasing to Yahweh so the fourth commandment is not telling us that we are to work each and every single day Sunday through Friday but it is telling us not to work on the Sabbath but it's telling us even more not only we ourselves must not do any work on the Sabbath neither must those who are under our control verse 10 says you nor your son nor your daughter nor your male servant nor your female servant nor your cattle nor your stranger who is within your gates none of them is allowed to work let's also turn to Deuteronomy 5 for where the Ten Commandments are stated also Deuteronomy 5 verses 14 and 15 but the seventh day is the Sabbath of Yahweh thy Elohim, in it thou shalt not do any work, thou nor thy son, nor thy daughter, nor thy manservant, nor thy maidservant, nor thine ox, nor thine ass, nor any of thy cattle, nor thy stranger that is within thy gates, that thy manservant and thy maidservant may rest as well as you, and remember that thou wast a servant in the land of Egypt and that Yahweh thy Elohim brought thee out thence through a mighty hand and by a stretched out arm therefore Yahweh thy Elohim commanded thee to keep the Sabbath day here we find an interesting addition that your male servant and your female servant may rest as well as you so our servants or employees are to rest as we ourselves this implies of course that we are not to pay anyone to serve us on the Sabbath for example in a restaurant or that we don't pay a painter to paint our house on the Sabbath some will say well these people working in the restaurant are breaking the Sabbath anyway so why can't we eat out on the Sabbath well, the reason is pretty basic. The sixth commandment says, do not murder. So, does this mean that we can hire a professional killer to murder someone as long as we don't pull the trigger of the gun ourselves? No, of course not. Even according to our civil laws, we would be guilty of murder, even though, technically speaking, we would not be the ones who did the killing. But we would be held entirely responsible of this murder and rightly so that's a general principle that's endorsed by Yahweh too not only are we not to sin ourselves but we are not to ask or push or others to sin either Otherwise, Yahweh will consider us just as guilty as the one who is committing the sin, technically speaking. Let's see an example of this. We all know the story of David's adultery with Bathsheba and how he got rid of her husband Uriah. Let's turn to 2 Samuel, 2 Samuel chapter 11. Samuel chapter 11 uh, let's go to verses 14 to 17 and it came to pass in the morning that David wrote a letter to Joab and sent it by the hand of Uriah 
and he wrote in the letter saying set ye Uriah in the forefront of the hottest battle and retire you from him that he may be smitten and die and it came to pass when Joab observed the city that he assigned Uriah unto a place where he knew that valiant men were and the men of the city went out and fought with Joab and there fell some of the people of the servants of David and Uriah the Hittite died also let's go skip down to verses 26 and 27 and when the wife of Uriah heard that Uriah her husband was dead she mourned for her husband and when the morning was past David sent and fetched her to his house and she became his wife and bare him a son but the thing that David had done displeased Yahweh in the next chapter we will read verse 9 this is what uh, uh, Nathan said Nathan the prophet who was sent by Yahweh to David to rebuke him verse 9 Nathan says wherefore hast thou despised the commandment of Yahweh to do evil in his sight thou hast killed Uriah the Hittite with the sword and hast taken his wife to be thy wife and hast slain him with the sword of the children of Ammon so note on, notice what Nathan says here <clears throat> he says you have killed Uriah you have killed him with the sword of the people of Ammon and the same is true is, is true if we eat out on the Sabbaths Yahweh holds both us and those working in the restaurant responsible of breaking the fourth commandment but they do it out of ignorance while we should know better some say that it's okay to eat out on the Sabbath during the Feast of Tabernacles because we are not within our gates but the Bible contains no exception allowing us to eat out on the annual Sabbaths on the contrary let's see that in Nehemiah chapter 10 Nehemiah chapter 10 verses 28 to 31 Nehemiah 10 28 and the rest of the people the priests, the Levites, the porters, the singers, the Nethinims, and all they that had separated themselves from the people of the lands unto the law of Elohim, their wives, their sons, and their daughters, everyone having knowledge and having understanding, they clave to their brethren, their nobles, and entered into a curse and into an oath to walk in Elohim's law, which was given by Moses, the servant of Elohim, and to observe and do all the commandments of Yahweh our Elohim and his judgments and his statutes and that we would not give our daughters unto the people of the land nor take, our, nor take their daughters for our sons and if the people of the land bring ware or any victuals on the Sabbath day to sell that we would not buy it of them on the Sabbath or on the holy day and that we would leave the seventh year and the exaction of every debt. So, these Jews are committing themselves to follow the law of Yahweh, among other, th among other things, not to buy merchandise or food on the Sabbath or a holy day. Notice that it says, on the Sabbath or a holy day, any holy day without exception. So, we don't buy food on a holy day, not in a supermarket, nor in a restaurant. Is all this a minor detail that Yahweh will readily overlook? Or is it even Pharisaic legalism? Well, let me answer with another question. Was Nehemiah a Pharisee, or was he a faithful servant of Yahweh? And is this an important issue in Yahweh's eyes? Let's turn to Nehemiah 13, verses 15 to 18. Nehemiah 13, verse 15. In those days 
So I in, Jeru in Judah some treading wine presses on the Sabbath, and bringing in sheaves and leading and lading asses, as also wine, grapes and figs, and all manner of burdens which they brought into Jerusalem on the Sabbath day. And I testified against them in the day wherein they sold victuals. So he is talking about Nehemiah. There dwelt men of Tyre also therein, which brought fish and all manner of ware, and sold on the Sabbath unto the children of Judah and in Jerusalem. Then I contended with the nobles of Judah, and said unto them, What evil thing is this that you do and profane the Sabbath day? Did not your fathers thus, and did not our Elohim bring all this evil upon us and upon this city? Yet you bring more wrath upon Israel by profaning the Sabbath. Notice that Nehemiah is telling here that selling and buying is profaning the Sabbath. It was one of the main reasons why Yahweh brought the disaster of captivity on the Jews. So, in Yahweh's eyes, this is an extremely important issue. Do you share Yahweh's point of view? If not, are you willing to change yours? Yahweh won't change his point of view. Those who eat out on the Sabbath on the Sabbaths usually refer to Matthew 12, 1 to 8 to defend their practice. But this passage isn't dealing with going to restaurants, nor with buying food, nor with asking others to prepare a meal. Let's turn to Matthew 12. Now I know in most assemblies of Yahweh I don't think this is really an issue, but you know when you have people who contradict you, other Sabbath keepers who might try to convince you into a more lax, relaxed way of observing the Sabbath, you should be ready to give an answer. So this is one passage that they abuse to defend their practice of eating out on the Sabbath while claiming to keep the Sabbath anyway. So let's read it, Matthew 12 verses 1 to 8. At that time Yeshua went on the Sabbath day through the wheat field, and his disciples were hungry, and began to pluck the heads of wheat, and rubbing them in their hands they did eat. But when the Pharisees saw it, they said unto him, Behold, thy disciples do that which is not lawful to do upon the Sabbath day. But he said unto them, Have you not read what David did when he was hungry, and they that were with him? how he entered into the house of Yahweh and did eat the showbread, which was not lawful for him to eat, neither for them which were with him, but only for the priests? Or have you not read in the law how that on the Sabbath days the priests in the temple profane the Sabbath and are blameless? But I say unto you that in this place is one greater than the temple, but if you had known what this means, I will have mercy and not sacrifice, you would not have condemned the guiltless. For the Son of Man is master even of the Sabbath day. So this is simply saying that the disciples were guiltless for plucking and eating heads of grain as they were walking through the grain fields. It's rather mysterious to me how anyone can conclude from this that it's okay to pay others to prepare a meal for you on the Sabbath. And did you notice something else? It was the disciples who plucked heads of grain. Yeshua didn't. The Pharisees didn't accuse him, but his disciples for doing it. They accused him for allowing them to do it. And he, the Son of Man, decided that his disciples could pluck heads of grain, just as Yahweh decided that David and his men could eat the showbread. Let's read the story in 1 Samuel 22, verses 9 to 10. <coughs> 1 
1 Samuel 22, verses 9 to 10. story here <clears throat> this is uh, when um, uh, Saul was accusing the priests of having helped uh, have, having had a conspiracy so to speak uh, against him uh, with David they supported David to conspire against him uh, then answered Doeg the Edomite which was set over the servants of Saul, and said, I saw the son of Jesse coming to Nob, to Ahimelech the son of Hahitub, and he inquired of Yahweh for him, and gave him victuals, and gave him the sword of Goliath the Philistine. So, what happened is this, the high priest inquired of Yahweh, he got Yahweh's consent, and then gave provisions to David and his men. So this wasn't even the high priest's personal decision, he first inquired of Yahweh. And here in Matthew 12, the Messiah gave his consent to his disciples to pluck heads of grain on the Sabbath, although he himself refrained from doing that. Isn't it strange that true believers would want to justify themselves for dining out on the Sabbath by referring to the example of the disciples, while not even considering the possibility of following Yeshua's example, who preferred not to pluck any heads of grain. I would think that Yeshua's example here is at least as worthwhile following as the example of the disciples. Another objection that some come up with is utilities such as water and electricity. Their argument goes something like this. Every time you use water or electricity on the Sabbath, you are buying and selling. So it's okay to buy a meal in the restaurant and have them prepare it for you. Well, this is really an excuse for continuing to transgress Yahweh's clear instructions in Exodus 16, which we read in the fourth commandment and in Nehemiah. If you observe Yahweh's instructions in Exodus 16 to prepare the Sabbath meals on Friday, then you eat those meals on the Sabbath and you have no reason to go to the restaurant on the Sabbath. As for the utilities, these are things beyond our control. This world is organized in such a way that we need electricity and water and other utilities every single day of our lives. And we don't control the production and distribution of those utilities. By the way, even if we would somehow manage to, sudden, to suddenly stop consuming water and electricity on the Sabbath, that would cause no one in the utility companies to work even one single second less. On the contrary, if too many people would suddenly stop consuming electricity at sunset on Friday evening and suddenly start consuming electricity again at sunset on Saturday evening that would cause disturbances and extra work. Going to a restaurant is within our control, the way of operating of the utility companies is not within our control. Now, the famous ox in the ditch Let's turn to Luke 13, Luke 13, there's always the exception to the rule of course, Luke 13 verses 10 to 17, and talking about Yeshua here, and he was teaching in one of the synagogues on the Sabbath, and behold, there was a woman which had a spirit of infirmity 18 years and was bowed together and could in no wise lift up herself. And when Yahshua saw her, he called her and said unto her, Woman, thou art loosed from thine infirmity. 
and he laid his hands on her and immediately she was made straight and glorified Yahweh. And the ruler of the synagogue answered with indignation because that Yahshua had healed on the Sabbath day and said unto the people, There are six days in which men ought to work. In them therefore come and be healed and not on the Sabbath day. Yahshua then answered him and said, Thou hypocrite, does not each one of you on the Sabbath lose his ox or his ass from the stall and lead him away to watering? And ought not this woman, being a daughter of Abraham, whom the adversary has bound, lo, these eighteen years be loosed from this bond on the Sabbath day? And when he had said these things, all his adversaries were ashamed, and all the people rejoiced rejoiced for all the glorious things that were done by him. Let's also read Luke 14, the first six verses, Luke 14, 1 to 6. And it came to pass, as he went into the house of one of the chief Pharisees to eat bread on the Sabbath day, that they watched him. And behold, there was a certain man before him which had the dropsy. And Yahshua answering spake unto the lawyers and Pharisees, saying, Is it lawful to heal on the Sabbath day? And they held their peace. And he took him and healed him and let him go. And answered them, saying, Which of you shall have an ass or an ox fallen into a pit? and will not straightway pull him out on the Sabbath day. And they could not answer him again to these things. So we, here we have this ox in the ditch. These passages show that you are not supposed to let someone or even an animal suffer on the Sabbath. You pull the ox out of the ditch, even if that takes considerable effort and work on the Sabbath. Yeshua healed people on the Sabbath, but this did not take any work on his part. Some people say that an ox doesn't fall in a ditch every Sabbath. And uh, of course we shouldn't push the ox in the ditch every single Sabbath, huh? so we can pull it out. That's true of course, but these people mean to say that working in this, on the Sabbath in order to prevent people or animals from suffering should be very exceptional but there there are cases where where this is not an exception if I may uh, give uh, an example of my own uh, my daughter is heavily handicapped and even on the Sabbath she needs to be taken care of and that is hard work I don't push any ox in the ditch, but it's uh, every day that she, every Sabbath day that she is at home. I'm working hard, pretty hard to take good care of her. And I think Father Yahweh would hold me guilty if I would let her suffer, pretending I need to rest on the Sabbath. So we need some uh, discernment and judgment and not say, well, this is an exception, it can happen only once every th three years or so. Well. You may be in a situation where you need to leave, relieve suffering of your child or your mother or, or your brother or whatever. Every single Sabbath that can happen. Then uh, can we travel on the Sabbath? Let's turn to Exodus 16, Exodus 16, 29. Very, very clear instruction it seems. Uh, see, for that Yahweh has given you the Sabbath, therefore he gives you on the sixth day the bread of two days. Abide you every man in his place, that no man go out of his place on the seventh day. And there is every clear instruction that no man go out of his place on the seventh day. Very clear. But of course we need to put all instructions together, we hardly ever find the whole truth on a topic in one single place. Let's turn to Leviticus 23.3 again. 
Six days work shall be done, but the seventh day is a Sabbath of rest, a holy convocation. You shall do no work therein, it is the Sabbath of Yahweh in all your dwellings. So there is a holy convocation on the Sabbath day that is commanded by Yahweh. Let's go also to Hebrews 10, the New Testament, Hebrews 10 verse 25. And let us consider one another to provoke unto love and to good works, not forsaking the assembling of ourselves together, as the manner of some is, but exhorting one another, and so much the more as you see the day approaching. So, what we see here is that there is a commandment to go to Holy Convocation on the Sabbath day. And nowadays, this can be, this can be a quite some, involves quite some traveling. This is a <coughs> commandment. We must go to services, and even I would say if that takes uh, an hour or two hour travel by car, or by train or mass transportation. Well, that's you're following the order of Yahweh to assemble on the on the to, on the Sabbath day to have a holy convocation. So then, uh, what about Exodus 16, 29? Why does it say that everyone must remain in his place? You know, it's always good to read the context of a verse. Let's just do that. Exodus 16, 27. And it came to pass that there went out some of the people on the seventh day for to gather and they found none, that is, they found no manna. And Yahweh said unto Moses, How long refuse you to keep my commandments and my laws? See, for that Yahweh has given you the Sabbath, therefore he gives you on the sixth day the bread of two days. Abide you every man in his place, let no man go out of his place on the Sabbath day. So they went out to work, to gather food. Yahweh told them to stay uh, where they were in order to prevent them from working on the Sabbath. So this instruction can't be used to overrule Yahweh's clear command to have a holy convocation on the Sabbath. As I said, even if you need to use mass transportation, and so buy a ticket, to go to services on the Sabbath, that's okay. Then. Another topic, lighting fires on the Sabbath day. Exodus 35, verses 2 and 3. Exodus 35, verses 2 and 3. Six days shall work be done, but on the seventh day there shall be to you an holy day, a Sabbath of rest to Yahweh. Whosoever does work therein shall be put to death. You shall kindle no fire throughout your habitations upon the Sabbath day. In the Holman Christian Standard Bible, this verse reads, Do not light a fire in any of your homes on the Sabbath day. Notice that this verse says not to light a fire. It does not tell us not to keep a fire burning that was made before the Sabbath begun. So it's perfectly all right to put a block of wood on the fire on the Sabbath to keep it burning. Yahweh doesn't want us to suffer from cold in the winter, so we can turn on the central heating on the Sabbath. Normally there is a pilot light that's always burning. When we turn on the heating, the pilot light becomes a big fire. So we are not lighting a fire, but we are adding fuel to a fire that's already burning. And turning on the heating can hardly be qualified as work. We saw earlier that observing the Sabbaths is a sign between Yahweh and his people. We also saw that buying and selling on the Sabbaths is one way to profane them. 
Now let's turn to Revelation for just a moment. The book of Revelation. Revelation 13, chapter 13. Uh, verses 16 and 17. <clears throat> Um, this is talking uh, about the beast. <coughs> and he calls us all, both small and great, rich and poor, free and bond, to receive a mark in their right hand or in their foreheads, and that no man might buy or sell, save he that had the mark or the name of the idol of the beast or the number of his name. <coughs> in the Holman Christian Standard Bible this reads and he requires everyone small and great rich and poor free and slave to be given a mark on his right hand or on his forehead so that no one can buy or sell unless he has the mark the beast's name or the number of his name so the beast has a mark or sign too and like Yahweh's sign it has also to do with buying and selling. Some think that Sunday observance is the mark of the beast, but will all Muslims and atheists in the world suddenly become Sunday keepers? I don't think so. My suggestion, and I insist this is my suggestion, is that this mark of the beast will be given to those who profane the Sabbath by buying and or selling on it. Yahweh's sign is keeping the Sabbaths holy, so it would be logical that the mark of the beast would be the exact opposite, that is, profaning the Sabbath. Technically speaking, it would be very easy to introduce this mark of the beast. The government stops the use of cash money. All payments must be made with a debit or credit card. Then the government checks who never uses his debit or credit card on the Sabbath, and their cards are blocked. Impossible to buy or sell anything anymore. I repeat, this is just my idea, of course. I can't prove from the Bible that this is exactly the way it will happen. One thing is for, is sh for sure, however. Those who don't profane the Sabbaths, but keep them holy, and who keep all of Yahweh's commandments will not receive the mark of the beast. No one will have Yahweh's seal as well as the mark of the beast on his or her forehead. Those professing to keep the Sabbaths but who are in reality profaning them by buying or selling or any other way will not receive Yahweh's seal of protection on their foreheads, but will be killed when they refuse to worship the image of the beast, as you can read in Revelation 13, 15. Revelation 13, 15. And he had power to give life unto the idol of the beast, that the idol of the beast should both speak, and cause that as many as would not worship the idol of the beast should be killed. Now, so far we have seen what we can't do on the Sabbaths. We can't work, we can't work, nor buy and sell. We can't allow anyone or even any animal to work for us. <clears throat> on the weekly Sabbath and on the Day of Atonement we can't even prepare food. And we are told to eat on the Sabbath what is left over from what we prepared on Friday. With so many don'ts. How can we ever delight in the Sabbath? Yet this is exactly what we are commanded to do. Let's turn to Isaiah 58. Isaiah 58, verses 13 and 14. Isaiah 58, 13 If thou restrain thy foot for the sake of the Sabbath, not doing thy business on my holy day, 
and call the Sabbath a delight, the Holy of Yahweh honorable, and shalt honor him, not doing thine own ways, nor finding thine own pleasure, nor speaking vain words, then shalt thou delight thyself in Yahweh, and I will call to thee to ride upon the high places of the earth, and feed thee with the heritage of Jacob thy father, for the mouth of Yahweh has spoken it. So, how can we rejoice in the Sabbath day? We are not to be doing our own pleasures, our own pleasure on Yahweh's holy day. That means that we aren't to be pursuing our hobbies or leisure activities. That does not preclude doing any enjoyable things on the Sabbath how, whatsoever, for we are to find delight in it. The point is that whatever we do, Yahweh must be an intrinsic part of it. A family walk through a natural setting, for example, is a wonderful way to get in touch with the great Yahweh who made the beautiful creation we see. When the seventh day arrives, we must stop pursuing our own ways. That's the things we normally do. We must stop seeking our own pleasure, that is, just trying to have fun. And we must stop speaking our own words, that's the everyday things we talk about that do not involve Yahweh or spiritual things. This last one is often very hard to follow, because out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth, the mouth speaks. That's Matthew 12, 34. To truly keep the Sabbath in the spirit, we must focus our minds on Yahweh and those things He wants us to be concerned with during His holy time. Then, as Yahweh promises, we will be truly blessed. Furthermore, in addition to worshipping with uh, other true believers on his weekly holy day, we should remember that Messiah's approach that it is lawful to do good on the Sabbath, which we read in Matthew 12. So this is a day we can use for making encouraging phone calls or writing letters to the sick, the shut-ins or the fellow believers who are lonely. It may also be possible <coughs> to visit uh, the sick or others in need on the Sabbath or have them over for a Friday evening meal. Now, a good way of re rejoicing on the Sabbath day is uh, having fellowship meals, as we just read, as we just saw on the Friday evening or after services on the Sabbath day itself. But a word of caution is uh, is appropriate here. Let's turn to Luke 10, Luke 10, verses 38 to 42. Luke 10 verses 38 to 42 <clears throat> Now it came to pass as they went that he entered into a certain village that's uh, talking about Yeshua and a certain woman named Martha received him into her house and she had a sister called Miriam which also sat at Yeshua's feet and heard his word but Martha was cumbered with much serving, and came to him, and said, Rabbi, dost thou not care that, I, that my sister has left me to serve alone? Bid her therefore that she help me. And Yeshua answered and said unto her, Martha, Martha, thou art careful and troubled about many things. But one thing is needful, and Miriam has chosen that good part, which shall not be taken away from her. Like Martha, we could, be, we could be very busy on the Sabbath with much serving, even if the meal is prepared in advance. So let's keep it simple. Even a simple bread meal will do. Let's turn to Acts 2. 
Acts 2 verses 46 and 47. Acts chapter 2 verse 46. And they, that's the true believers, they continuing daily with one accord in the temple and breaking bread from house to house, did eat their food with gladness and singleness of heart, praising Yahweh and having favor, favor with all the people. And Yahweh added to the congregation daily such as were being saved. So, no need for an appetizer, an entree, a dessert followed by coffee or tea. Eating your food with gladness and simplicity of heart is what counts. Let's not follow Martha's example, who was worried and troubled about many things. Rather, let's follow Mary's example, who listened to Yeshua's words. Fellowship and uplifting conversation, conversations about spiritual things are more impo important, Sabbaths, important aspects of the Sabbath than a delicious meal. On the Sabbath we should delight in spiritual things. So, in conclusion, as in all things, we should always follow Yeshua's example. And I have a list here of things that Yeshua did on the Sabbath. How did Yeshua honor the Sabbath? He assembled with other Jews in the synagogue. For us that would be, we assemble with other true believers in the congregation. He read from the scriptures. He healed the sick. For us that could be also healing or simply visiting the sick. He shared meals. He took walks with close friends. He criticized self-righteous religious leaders. He inspired hope in the weak. He stayed in constant contact with his father. In conclusion, let's not profane the Sabbath by working on it or having others work for us, nor any other way. Rather, Let's keep the Sabbath day holy, just as Yeshua did. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. The song I'd like to share with you is Behold the Lamb.
Glorious things of thee are spoken, Zion city evermore. He whose words cannot be broken, Form thee for his own abode. On the rock of ages founded, What can shake thy sure repose? With salvation's walls surrounded, Thou mayest smile at all thy foes. See the streams of living waters Springing from eternal love. Well supply thy sons and daughters, And all fear and want remove. Who can faint when such a river ever flows the thirst to switch? Grace like a Elohim, the giver, never fails from age to age. Round each habitation hovering, see the cloud and fire appear. For a glory and a covering, showing Yahweh's ever near. Blessed inhabitants of Zion, washed in the Redeemer's blood. Yahshua, whom their souls rely on, makes them kings and priests to Yah. Savior, if of Zion city, I through grace a member am. Let the world deride or pity, I will glory in thy name. Fading is the worldling's pleasure, all his boasted pomp and show. Solid joys and lasting treasure, none but Zion's children know. Hallelujah. <clears throat> well, hallelujah. I want to thank Marcel for that dedicated message, and he and his wife coming forward and sharing their joy and their singing and encouraging us. Mm -hmm by making sounds of joy and praise. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Good job. Praise we really Hallelujah. appreciate that. I have to admit something. You know, it says confess our faults before one another. That we have never, as far as I can remember, and I'm looking at my wife because she has a better memory, that we have never had, and I don't think I've ever heard, a message on actually how to keep the Sabbath. What things we're not supposed to do, things that we can do, and especially a list, a laundry list, a, a study of what Yahshua did on the Sabbath. Mm -hmm. And I think that was very helpful and uh, for us, even though we've been in the faith a long time, we're very careful about the Sabbath, but new people that are coming in, and, and I have to admit that many times people have come up to me and said, what can I do, what I can't do on the Sabbath mm -hmm. day, because they want to do right. They want to follow the yes. scripture. And you know, we may find it strange. We are peculiar people. Yahweh asks us to do peculiar things like not eat leavened bread and puffy things uh, with leavening in them during certain days in the spring, seven days. Sounds strange. Mm -hmm. But if we want to be like Yahshua, if we want to be dedicated, obedient, uh, have law and order and blessing in our life, blessing from him when we do the things that he commands us to do. Even though, you know, like in the army, the army might ask you to do something in training or do something in a regular way every way or every month, uh, that, that military commander has a reason for it. It's for our good. Well, even more so, Yahweh shows us to do things that are for our good. We may not see the purpose of it right away. So, the Sabbath being one of the foundational things, we had a good message today of how we can keep it and how our, even our heart is involved watching the words that we say. That this is a, a guideline for us. That we will 
do the things that are pleasing Yahweh and Yahshua, and then we will receive a blessing. And the more we become like Yahshua, and the more we do the right things on the Sabbath and the rest of our walk, we will grow to a point that truly we will see that the Sabbath is a delight, is a blessing, is a rest, and it's good for us. We need that rest after six days of stress and toil and labor and the slings and arrows and things that we receive during the week. We need that rest. He knows we need it. It's not because he's trying to control us. It's not because he's trying to oppress us. He's, he's saying we need it. It's a spiritual, physical, and emotional gift to us. And I think that was made clear during the message. And so we love the Sabbath day. Mm -hmm. Maybe in the beginning we didn't love it. It was frustrating having to stop uh, all of our work and our plans and things. We want to get something done extra on that Saturday that we couldn't get done during the week. But we learned to love it and appreciate it and, and keep it. And so we had a very good message today. All of this, if you look and you sit back in your chairs now on the outreach program, mm -hmm. and you think about everything that was done today before you on the uh, outreach program, it all fits together. It all goes together. Yahweh and Yeshua have a plan for us for good. Mm -hmm. We need to trust that. Even if it sounds a, a little peculiar to do something he asks, it's for our good, it's for a reason. And there's always a spiritual reason behind it that is righteous and true and good. Tov. So we pray that you've been blessed on the outreach program today as we have here in the assembly. We've had gifts manifest and all kinds of good things. We look forward to being with you again. And we hope that you are keeping the holy days. It may be a little different day. Uh, you may not get this till next year. But you're keeping Yahweh's days. It's part of the covenant, things we need to do. Yahweh bless you and be with you. Hallelujah. In Yahshua's name.